Welcome everybody to tonight's episode of Profound States. Uh, tonight's guest is Lorian Fenton, and uh, I will read her bio. Uh, Lorian became actively involved in the San Francisco Bay Area UFO community uh, after almost dying from a, a mysterious form of pneumonia during the H1N1 scare of summer 2009. It was that near-death experience which propelled her into doing the work she loves in a community that she has been passionate about her entire life. Uh, Lauren is the MUFON Marin and Sonoma Counties Section Director holding meet meetings in Pe Petaluma, California on the first Saturday of the month. Uh, that's at www.mufonmarinsonoma.com. Her current occupations include web designer, bookkeeper, and conference producer. Uh, her her nonprofit, Conscious Community Events, produces UFOCon, held annually in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, if that was enough, she was it has a weekly internet radio talk show, The Fenton Perspective, on Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific Time and 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on Revolution Radio at www freedomslips.com um i think that's probably enough she has a couple cats that passed away and um yeah i think the rest of it i will I'll leave off so uh <laughs> lorian introduce yourself in any fashion beyond what i've stated well, that last part you didn't read was about the fact that uh i finally saw a big black triangle ufo on november 1st 2014 and uh i'd seen other craft before that but i'd never seen a big black triangle up close and personal like that it was very low and had you know three lights and it you know the center light glowing and it was quite extraordinary and i was in a parking lot with about 10 other people and only one other person saw it with me so it was really interesting how you know aliens don't let everybody see them unless they want you to see them so there you go well, it also said in that part of the bio that you're not a not a you've never been abducted that i know of okay. um, so if yeah, you're not yeah look, um charles the problem with being abducted and and I, all my friends are abductees, okay? These are well-spoken people in the community that go on stage and talk about their abductions. Why? Why do they do it and I don't? It's because I don't remember them very well. And the ones I do remember are spotty. And one of the most extraordinary abductions I ever had, they told me to keep my eyes closed the whole time, so I never saw anything. And then the other one, um, I only remember like 10 seconds of it. So it's really hard for me to be one of those people out there saying, oh yeah, I'm gonna tell you all about my abductions because I was, I am so um, brainwashed by the aliens. I mean, they tell me to forget stuff and I forget it, you know? <laughs> and I've never done hypnosis because I'll tell you, I, I don't really want to know what happened. I, I'm not one of these people who has, has the burning desire to find out what the aliens have done to me. The things I do remember were so um, crazy that I'm not sure I want to know the rest of the story, you know? Well, tell us, uh, okay, so uh, do you remember any of your past lives? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got tons of past life stories. I've got all kinds of stories about um, putting on my super soldier and mind control conferences that are crazy. And I've got stories about the, the time we were taken in the 2014 conference all together as a group. And I've got stories from my childhood that uh, are, are probably about um you know a 600 page book of what i what's happened to me since i was a kid um i'm very psychic and uh very um like you know i've seen dead people i you know the whole nine yards and um lots of ufos and and uh, had some really crazy experiences which how one far, would you like me to talk about first well how far does your memory go back into childhood well, some, how early how early yeah, 
How early? I mean, what's the earliest age you remember? Uh, well, the first incident that I remember very well is when I was about six years old and I manifested a rabbit. Have you ever heard this story? I may have, um, but go ahead anyway. I'm not sure if um, I talked about it when you were on my radio show, which is quite fun. Um, I was about six and we went to the Multnomah County Fair in Port, I lived in Portland, Oregon at the time, went to the Multnomah County Fair and um, back then, you know, there wasn't much at the county fairs, there was, you know, a few rides, uh, lots of uh, um, square dancing and fiddle playing and very country like. And 4-H was huge. I mean, it was just, it was the thing at the country fair, uh, was selling it livestock and the 4-H competitions. And so my grandfather, we lived on a small farm and he needed a new ram uh, for the sheep. And he was there to just check him out and see if there was anything he wanted to buy, uh, which is pretty normal for our area, a lot of farmers. So we're there. And uh, we get into the the small animal area and there were rabbits everywhere. And I said to my grandfather, I said, oh, I want to look at the rabbits. He goes, OK, sure, go ahead. So he goes, I'm going over to the sheep. Uh, I'll come back and get you in a little bit. And my grandmother had taken off with my younger sister and they were off doing something else. I don't know what. But bottom line, I walk up to the, the prize winning black, huge rabbit that was there with the big blue ribbon and the brother and sister who had raised him were like, oh, and I said, can I pet him? They said, oh, you can hold him if you want. He's really tame. And I said, okay, great. So I sit down in the, uh, the they used to put cedar shavings on the floors of all these places. So I'm sitting in the cedar shavings and uh, I'm petting the rabbit and about a half an hour goes by and I just, I fell in love with this rabbit, Charles. I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is the best thing since sliced bread. Now you gotta remember at home, we had sheep, we had donkeys, we had chickens, we had ducks, we had turkeys. We had everything but rabbits. And uh, so I was thinking, oh yeah, we should have a rabbit too. And so my grandfather comes back and I go, I want the rabbit. And he goes, no, you can't have a rabbit. And I go, why can't I have a rabbit? And he's like, can't have it because they, they make such a mess and, there's, and they make more of them and I don't want one and I'm not building a hutch. And I said, and he goes, you'd have to take care of it because I'm not going to take, you know, the, all the excuses, right? And, but I kind of got to him and he finally looked over at the boy and girl, uh, sister and brother who had um, raised the rabbit and said, how much would you want for it? They go, well, we can't sell it now. It has to go to auction. And we're not even think we're not sure we're even going to sell it. And uh, he's like, okay. He goes, we got to go. They're not going to sell it. Goodbye. You know, kind of thing. So I'm crying. I, I really want the rabbit. So we get in the car. We're heading home. And about a mile away from the, well, now all the way back in the car. I don't know if anybody remembers this, but if you're as old as me, you do. Um, there were uh, bench seats in all cars back in the 60s. This is 1963, by the way. And uh, I'm sliding back and forth on the bench seat between my grandfather's ear and my grandmother's ear. And I don't know if anybody remembers that, but you could just move around back then. You weren't strapped in like you're going to Mars in these car seats or anything. And so I'm sliding back and forth and I'd say to my grandmother, I really want a rabbit. Will you guys get me a rabbit? And she's like, no, to ask your grandfather. And I'd slide over and then he'd say, no, you can't have a rabbit. Five minutes later, I'm like sliding back over to my grandmother. Well, if I feed it, can I have a rabbit? She's like, no, I don't think so. And then I'm sliding back and forth all the way home. And this is about a half hour drive. So by the time we get about a mile away from the house, I start, I get in the middle of the bucket seat right between the two of them and I start praying. And I put my hands together. Now I'd been at, I was in first grade at a Catholic church, you know, Catholic school. And I've been going to Catholic church my whole life. And I got my hands into the praying position and I bowed my head and I'm really loud <laughs> like the priest. And I'm saying, dear God, please let me have a rabbit. I know I'll take good care of it. And I'm begging, you know, for a rabbit. And I got to tell you, Charles, it was one of the, it's the first time 
I felt this feeling that I'd felt off and on the rest of my life. And this feeling is, it's like my insides get warm and my head gets kind of light and I feel this great peace or presence within me. And I can't explain it to anybody at the time. I had no idea what it was. I didn't even really recognize it as anything because I'm six years old and what do I know? I just thought when you prayed that happened, right? So I'm praying and I get that feeling. And I also get a feeling at the same time of love and peace that's remarkable, but it only happens for a fraction of a second. And um, I just stopped praying because I thought, you know, well, if God's, you know, I'm six years old and I'm kind of negotiating with myself. If God says I can have one, he'll give me one, you know, and I stopped. We pulled up to the driveway of our small farm and there's a gate. Every farm has a gate to keep animals in and out when you're driving in. Um, and so we're looking through the gate and there's a black blob. Now, the, the rabbit at the Multnomah County Fair was totally black. There's a black blob sitting in the middle of the driveway about 20 feet from the gate uh, on the other side of it. And everybody's looking at this black blob. My grandfather, get, he's looking at my, he gets out of the car, but as he gets out of the car, he's looking at my grandmother like, what the heck? And he opens the gate and there sitting in the middle of the driveway is a black rabbit, identical breed, identical size, the identical rabbit of what was at the Multnomah County Fair. And it's just sitting there waiting for my grandfather to pick it up. So he picks it up, he walks to the car, and my grandmother and my grandfather are still looking at each other like, holy whatever. And um, my sister is clapping and, and my grandfather looks at me and goes, I guess I'm gonna have to build that hutch after all. So that was kind of the, <laughs> the first time anybody in my family and I kind of knew something was up because the way they were looking at each other was just remarkable. I've never seen anything, you know, after that in that look. But about uh, 20 years later, my grandmother said to me, you know, I always knew from that moment on, I knew you were the one in the family who got the gift because I, apparently my grandmothers on both sides of my family were both psychics. My Italian grandmother on my mother's side was the Italian in Portland, Oregon. When they were growing up, there was the Italian neighborhood, the Jewish neighborhood, the black neighborhood, the Irish neighborhood, you know, whatever. And they grew up in the Italian Jewish neighborhood. And in that neighborhood, my grandmother was the fortune teller. She was the one that everybody went to to have their cards read. And uh, so she was the psychic of the community. So um, I came from her side of the family. And then my grandmother on my father's side of the family was very psychic. She was a Rosicrucian. And uh, she never talked about being a Rosicrucian. She hid it from us all of her life. She said she was a Lutheran, but then we find out when she's dead. <laughs> it's got all this Rosicrucian material and she's been doing correspondence with the Rosicrucian church and practicing a Rosicrucian. And she was very, very psychic. And uh, yeah, so there you go. And uh, so out of the 21 grandchildren on one side of the family and the 18 on the other, both grandmothers said to me that I was the one who got whatever it was. So, yeah. Well, I do remember that story, but I'm I don't I, I'm glad you told it again because I think you probably gave a few more details this time than than the last. Yeah, when I'm talking about it on my show, I just kind of zip through it as a comparison to other people's uh, reality. So, so anyway. what was your first um, experience with aliens, or you know? Um, you know that's a good question because. I think I was in my early, late 20s and early 30s before I really started noticing that it wasn't just psychic phenomena that was going on around me. I, uh, I had been reading ufology for quite some time. I've been following ufology as close as you could back in the you know 70s is when I first really got into it. Um, 68, 69, 70, 78. I would say for a whole decade, I was going to the library and checking out every science fiction book I could get. I've read every, like all the Highland, Clark, everybody. I, I mean, I read them all. Plus, I would also read every UFO book I could get my hands on. At the time, there was only a dozen. I mean, it wasn't like you could just go to the library and check out anything. 
and uh, they were hard to get. Um, until Whitley Strieber wrote Communion, I think that was the breakthrough moment. That's when it started becoming personalized stories in print instead of science fiction stories about UFOs and aliens and that type of thing. So, yeah, and I think my first remembrance was one of the times that I, well, this was, let's see, I don't know how to explain this one. I think this one came first. I was laying in bed one night and uh, I wasn't feeling well that month. I was having a lot of issues and I found out later that I had some kind of uh, not life-threatening liver disease at the time, like a fatty liver type of disease. And, um, and I wasn't processing vitamin B properly. There were some things going on. Anyhow, so long story short, I hadn't been feeling well, but I didn't really know what was wrong with me at the time. And I was laying in bed and I said, Jesus, God, you know, if you could just please, um, you know, help me. I'm not feeling good. I don't know what's going on. And I started falling asleep and my eyes were, you know how it is when your eyes get heavy and you're just starting to close them for the first time. About halfway through my eyes closing, there was a bright flash on the side of the bed and I caught a glimpse. I mean, just a flash of a glimpse of an outline of a white light beam. That's the only way I can describe it because it was so white and so lit up that it was basically, and it was kind of in the shape of a human, but it may have been more light. I don't know. And there may have been an alien there, but I had closed my eyes and I couldn't open them back up again. That was the other problem. So I'm assuming it was some type of alien contact because I always said it was my angels or an angel, my guardian angel uh, coming to see me. And um, so in that moment, I was, well, I call it propelled. I don't know what other word to use for it, but I was taken to a place that was completely white light and very similar to the Star Trek um, Oh boy, what was the name of it? Uh, Deep Space Nine. There was a place where the uh, Avery Brooks, who played the captain, went to meet these disembodied aliens that lived in this <clears throat> other dimension. You're you're talking about the um, the pilot. The pilot. Deep Space Nine. That's when the, that's when they started. That's when the guys started talking to the uh, immortals uh, on the in that place you're talking about. It was right. in the pilot for Deep Space Nine. And exactly. Yeah. I, all I remember is that years later when I saw that, I went, oh, my God, that's exactly what my the place was like where I went. It was just totally white light and it's so, so bright here. I describe it as so bright that it had colors in it, almost like a abalone shell. I can't describe it. It's like it was colorful, but totally white at the same time. And I don't know if anybody ever, um, you know, has had that happen. I haven't heard it described, but maybe so. I don't know. But well, in that moment, I got to meet God. And <laughs> he was disembodied, just like those, um, you know, the that episode of Deep Space Nine. And it was like there were more than one of him within the voice. It sounded like a choir. And uh, they, we had a deep, long conversation about a lot of things. And um, all I remember is that I said, I want to stay with you. I don't want to go back. This was the, the last thing I remember. Oh, and by the way, the love there is so profound and the peace, the peace and the love there is so profound, there's no description of it because it doesn't exist in this this reality, in this dimension at all. We're incapable of that kind of love. It, it is, it's so deep and accepting and loving and um, just, it's mind boggling. That's all I can describe it. It's how, the only way I can describe it to people. Um, and anyhow, so I'm there and I finally said, oh, no, no, I don't want to go back. I like being here. This place is great. You know, I like talking to him. And uh, he says, no, you've got work to do. It's just beginning now. And I said, what do you mean it's just beginning? He goes, well, we gave you a vacation. 
He goes, you don't, you're, you, <laughs> you haven't done anything yet. I'm like, what do you mean I haven't done anything yet? You know? And he says, no, no, you'll see, you'll know when it's time. And then I woke up in my bed and I was like, oh no. I said, I don't want to be here. And I was so depressed. Charles, I can't describe the depression that hit me. It was so fast, so furious. And my body felt like lead. I weighed 110 pounds then. I was a professional dancer. I mean, I was like, I couldn't move out of the bed. It was, I, my body weighed so much. It was just horrific. I, I, I really think I died and they sent me back is what I think happened. But anyhow, so long story short, um, my husband at the time was a very busy guy. He was never home. And... I thought, you know what? I can go back. I can go back. I just have to kill myself and I can go back. So I'm like, I'm so excited. You know, I'm ready to kill myself. And um, he had just had surgery a while back and he had a whole bunch of painkillers he never took. And, and I had a bottle of Jack Daniels and I had some sleeping pills. And I thought, oh, if I mix them all up, I know I'll, I'll die and I get to go back, right? So I'm sitting there and so it, I take my time. It isn't like I just decided to do it. It took me about three or four hours. And I think um, it was about lunchtime for him because this all happened right when I, oh no, I'm sorry. This was, that was a different ex time. This was when um, he had not come home from work that night and he was still working on uh, out at the sugar cane factory or the, I'm sorry, the CNH sugar factory out in Benicia and um somehow he's working on the ship and he just decides he's got to go home he's got to go home right now that's what the, he said a voice in his head said you've got to go home right now and he didn't pay much attention to it and then he just said you know i'm not going to do it and then the voice said to him you've got to go home right now immediately and so he's like, what the hell's going on? I'm hearing voices in my head. And so he came home and he caught me in the act of trying to kill myself to go back to be with God. And uh, that was the only time he said he's ever had anything like that happen to him. And I've been in touch with him all these years. So it's pretty crazy that th that's how bad they wanted me to end up working for him. You know, <laughs> that was <laughs> the recruitment plan was to keep me, you know, here instead of going back home where I belong. So is that your only memory of God? Uh, what was that? Is that your only memory of God? Uh, yes, that's the only memory of God, um, knowing it was God that I was talking to. And mm -hmm. I've since then had a couple of downloads where they were telling me that 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 God that I went and talked to. Yeah was um, actually the source and the AI that runs the universe. And, and they said AI kind of like, that's the only way you'll understand it. So interesting, huh? Who, who is the, who said these things? Well, I, now I have these weird downloads and, it, and I'll tell you why, Charles. I don't want to see reptilians in my bedroom or greys talking to me. I really don't. I never have. I'm not interested in having those kind of beings scaring the bejesus out of me half of the time, right? Not knowing when they're going to freeze me up and take me to do probing or, you know, whatever. So I pretty much put my foot down when I was about, I think I was probably about 20. I, I said to them, knowing full well in the back of my consciousness that I've been dealing with them, right? I said, don't come and bother me like that. Please never do that to me. I just don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid of something that I love. You know, I love the fact that there's ETs. I love the fact that there's other dimensions. I love the fact that they're visiting us. I just don't want to see anything horrible that will scare me, that will make me be afraid of what I, I truly am very passionate about promoting. Okay. And even at 20 years old, I knew that, right? So, so I, how, did, how did you know you were dealing with aliens? What gave you the idea? I, I mean, here's an example. I When I was about 13 to 16, I lived with my parents at the time. I left home when I was 16. So be, the few years before I, I left home, I used to go out at night and go up to the high school near our house. And I used to run the track in the middle of the night because I'd work all day and get home at 10. I worked a swing shift. I'd get off at 10 o'clock at night because I started working when I was 14. 
and uh, don't ask me why I, I've always been working I feel like <laughs> anyhow so I started working when I was I was almost 15 when I started so anyhow I'd run I go up to this track and run at night and uh, I'd always be up there yelling at them to come and get me and I always be looking at the stars so I, I always knew that I was in touch with ET I just knew it I, it wasn't like I even had to question it or thought about it or anything I just knew it you know well so um that's it i mean and but there i mean there's a ton of other stories around all this but uh but in a nutshell seeing oh there was a lady who walked through my wall when i was about 18 years old and she pretty much told me at the time that i was an, an you know an extraterrestrial contactee she didn't say it like that but that's what she told me what did she, what did she look like Oh, this is a great story. I um I fell asleep one night and I'm I'm and I had <laughs> okay, this is one of the nights I got really, really drunk. I don't know why I did it, but uh I had gotten really drunk and uh I wasn't feeling good. And again, I think I may have pushed the limits of my body at the time because I wasn't supposed to be drinking alcohol at all because of my liver and the the problems I was having with it. And um, I may have died again, I don't know, but I sure felt like I did when I woke up the next day because my head hurt and my body hurt so bad, I can't, I couldn't believe it. But I'm laying there and I, I kind of was half awake, half asleep. And I started to sit up on my bed because I wasn't feeling good. I felt like something was really wrong, but I sat up on the bed with my feet, you know, hanging over the side. And I'm looking at my wall in the bedroom. And the next thing I know, the wall melts away and a white tunnel of swirling light, just like that room before I ever saw that room, by the way, this was 10 years before that. Um, it The swirling white tunnel appears and way far away, like a it looked like a block away, who knows? This woman walks through the tunnel down into my bedroom and the tunnel stays open behind her the whole time she's talking to me. She's got dark hair. She's about five foot ten. She's uh, very beautiful, um, thin. Um, she's wearing a, a pink orchid pink dress with gold trim on the sleeves and around the waist and on the bodice at the top and and in the trim, there's all these symbols and they're all changing and moving and they're light. They're like made out of light on the gold and it's transforming. And uh, while she's talking to me and she tells me, I can't, you know, it's so hard to remember what she said to me. I tried to write it down the next day, but pretty much that she was me and I was her and there is no time and um that they've been with me forever and they're going to protect me and take care of me and that i have work to do again another being telling me i got work to do i'm getting kind of tired of that but this was in a, this was in a dream or not in a dream no this was ha i don't know because are you in a dream when this happens i don't know if you're awake when it happens you're not awake i can tell you that you're definitely in another dimension or another time or time's frozen or or you're in your subconscious and and you're just automatically sitting up, you know. Well, dreams usually don't have all the details that you're talking about. I mean, they're not usually not that detailed. They could be. I mean, my wife's dreams are a lot more detailed than mine. But do you, did it feel like a dream at the time? No. It did it felt like half of a dream. It felt like half reality and half of a dream at the same time. The body feeling was like I was in a dream, but I know it was happening. It was definitely real. You know, whether now here's the question though, Charles. It was it real because they projected it for me to see happening? Or was it real that she was 3D reality like an alien would be? I don't think so. I think if my parents had walked into the room at the time, they probably would have just seen me looking at the wall. Okay. Because they have the ability. This is, this is. Well, you, you could have been, you could have gone to sleep and gone astral traveling too while you're sleeping. Well, sure. And maybe she astral traveled right into my astral travel, you know? 
Well, you know, anything's possible. Um, well, I mean, she came to me. It was definitely the wall went away. Now, I think it was some type of interdimensional uh, travel. I mean, I really, I mean, her interdimensional communication because I really believe she was there for me. And here's why I believe that because in 2011, I had another very profound experience. And this experience was the final of, of a long line of experiences like this over a, a 50 or 30 or 40 year time span where I finally ended up producing conferences and, and actually starting my MUFON group and really getting active in this community instead of just being on the sidelines. And um, that incident was when they put the sound of a helicopter in my head and no one else could hear it. So, are you, is that a truck? <laughs> that was a, I don't know if that was a motorcycle or what that was, but I've got oh, my yeah, window. Oh, that's pretty loud and cool, I got to tell you. <laughs> well, <laughs> the minute I said they put the sound of a helicopter in my head, it started. I thought that was kind of coincidental. <laughs> Uh, I've opened my window because it was getting hot in here earlier, and so there's a lot of loud vehicles that go driving past you. No, oh, that's okay, no problem. But anyhow, uh, so I I'm starting to think, Charles, that um, we have a whole thing going on where, you know, you're actually in this reality and their reality at the same time. Okay, and I I think that's how a lot of the contact is really happening. But what I was trying to get at was the fact that I don't personally, I have told them, do not come and scare me that, you know, that's the bottom line here. I don't need to be scared. I don't want to be scared. And because of that, I have this ability or they have the ability to contact me. I don't really put out the feelers for them to come to me. Um, I have these downloads where I'm half asleep and half awake and my body starts vibrating and then I'll have these full blown like major motion picture of contact, you know, it's like, and it, it's so profound and each one of them, the last set of series I had, I'll be writing about in my book, but they're, they're basically series of how our communication works and why it works and what we're doing together on a subconscious level and the and a conscious level and their reality is compared to our reality and you know yeah the last one i got at the end of all of the um the communications they told me that time travel was the answer to everything we're looking for here on earth about ufology and I was like, OK, so now I've been going down that path and there's very few people who understand time in our reality. Because time is is very um, you can't measure it except for through consciousness and 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 living through it. I mean, that's it. You know, we don't have any scientific mathematical formula that says this is time you know, and how to make it happen over and over again. We don't have the ability to do that, but ET does. ET time travels all the time. They go through different, and what I think time travel is, according to what they've told me, it's basically just layers of different dimensions uh, and being able to pop in and out of each dimension to create the next, you know, lifetime of, of time, okay? So when people say to you, oh, I remember all my past lives. Well, I find it fascinating because I they're not past lives to me. They are lives that are happening simultaneously to what's going on in my timeline right now. And I had a very profound experience around that, that they that they gave me. They give me all these crazy like experiences that prove their point when they're talking to me, you know. So right after this uh, time, you know, uh, download they gave me, uh, I was laying in bed and I was half awake and I was, you know, thinking about getting up. It was kind of like I'd just woken up and I was laying there thinking about, ah, oh, do I want to get up? And I heard myself come in the front door of the house. I had high heels on. I knew what dress I was wearing and I was click clacking all the way through the house. And I was on my cell phone talking to somebody 
and I walked over to the stove and I put on a pot of water. I heard it boil. I heard all of this and I was in the other room and I had a different job, a different thing altogether. And, but I was still living in this house. I, my hair was a different shade of color. I mean, things were just off. It was like, I was totally off from what I am now. And I could hear everything going on in the other room. Now, I knew if I'd got up and looked into the kitchen, I would not be able to see myself. But I knew that they were giving me a glimpse into the fact that there are probably 20 other me's in the same kind of timeline right next to the timeline I'm living in doing all kinds of things that may not be what's going on with me and now at this timeline. So... I thought that was interesting. And then <laughs> I had a fight with them about um, remembering a UFO that I saw. And uh, this was the one in 2011 during that whole experience. I looked out the window of that uh, place I was staying at and I saw three balls of light that were deep, dark red in an amber, you know, deep red, like in uh, the embers of a fire. And uh, they were in a triangle formation uh, right over the house. And I could kind of see a ship in there. Now, it was translucent if it was there, but I could still tell it was there. So I knew it was a triangle ship. Gosh, I'm, I'm trying to itch. I guess I should be talking about these guys. Anyhow, so um, I'm looking up at the ship and I'm thinking to myself, don't forget what this looks like, okay? About a month later... I wake up one morning and I'd have been having a fight with them the night before in my head. Like, you know, why do you take away memories of people? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? And so I wake up the next day and I knew something was missing out of my memory. I knew it. I was like, what the heck? I, something's wrong. I can't remember something. And they had done that too. Just, to, you know, anyhow, anyhow, this whole thing was a lesson from them, but I knew that I was missing something. I couldn't remember what it was. And then halfway through the day, I kept trying to remember and trying to remember what it was. I couldn't remember. And finally, the picture of that UFO over the house, what me looking up at it, that I took in my memory, popped back into my head. And I was like, oh, my God. That was literally taken out of my memory. And then I just put it, they just put it back in. And I thought, okay, you guys, that's rude. Why are you doing this to me? I need to remember this. And so the next day I wake up and it's gone again. So I go through this whole day trying to remember what it was. And then it pops back into my memory. I'm like, okay, you guys, this is really, you know, I have no, I do not understand why you're doing this to me. So I drew a picture of it and I put it by the side of the bed. So the next day they took it out again, but I had the picture there. So as soon as that happened and I looked over the picture, the memory came back instantly. And then they said to me, you've got to understand something. People, first of all, they don't want to remember. And for us taking the memory out, they don't ever try to remember what it was because it's so far beyond what most people can handle that it's easy for us to take it out of their mind and they never think about it again. That's also very easy for us to control who's talking about what, where, and how because we decide who gets to talk about it. And I thought, my God, this is profound. This is amazing. So anyhow, these are the kind of lessons and, and little tidbits I'm getting out of them as we go along. And I think one of the most profound moments was that that moment in 2011 when they when I first was, you know, doing things and they said, we can see through your eyes, we can control you, we can do anything we want, we can, you know, we basically are your gods and we can do anything we want to you. And I got to tell you, Charles, being one of the people that understands this on the planet, this is tough. And I, I got to tell you, most of the contactees don't even get this. And the few that do are as crazed about it as I am. It's like, oh, my God, the, the power they have over us is extraordinary. I mean, really extraordinary. And I don't know if it isn't 
that we have like 10 different types of ET and maybe the number one type of ET down at this level can't do that. Maybe it's only the white light beings at level eight that can do it. Or the, the woman who walked through my wall, my wall, that's like a, a, a uh, you know, a St. Germain type of ascended master can do this kind of stuff. I don't know. I don't know if the grays can do it, but they certainly can wipe your memory of anything that you've ever done with them if they want to. And but good luck you, getting all that information back. But you, know? you don't know who the people, the beings that are giving you all this information, you don't know who they are. Well, I suspect quite a few. Well, I, I have my suspicions and I'll tell you why, because I've got other people in my life over the years that are like either major contactees or they they have memory like melinda leslie is one of the people that i she's my best friend in ufology and she is a what we call a major contactee and she has been taken by the military by the ets by all these people and she's one of the women in the breeding programs and I'm not in the breeding programs that I know of. I just don't think so. I never had that inclination. Um, I, I don't deal with, the, I'm not a big gray fan. So I don't think I'm dealing with the grays like uh, Melinda is. Um, I think I'm dealing more with the the white light beans and the, you know, the ascended master type beans or angelic type beans. I may be totally wrong. I may be dealing with Plajarans for all I know, you know. Um, I don't know, like, like uh, Billy Meyer, you know, the, the people that the aliens that look like people. I don't know. I just I don't have a lot of remembrances. I do have one time I did get contacted by a reptilian and I know it was a reptilian because he was invisible. But when he we put his cheek on my cheek, it felt like the belly of a frog. That's the only way I can describe it to people. I mean, not that I, you know that I know what a belly of a frog feels like on my face, but that's the only thing I can equate it to is it felt like fish skin or, a, you know, a frog skin or, you know, something like that. Definitely reptilian snake skin. Now I've had snakes on my body because well, I was a belly dancer for quite a while. And uh, I used to dance with the snake at a, at a club that I danced at. So I know what a snake feels like, and it definitely felt like that. So. Go through that experience. Oh, you want me to tell you about it? Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. I'm leaving Las Vegas. It's 2013. No, not, not, the, not the snake, dancing with a snake. I'm talking about the reptilian. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm telling you about. I'm leaving okay. Las Vegas. Right. It's 2013. I just produced a conference there. And, um, gosh, what? I, oh, I got out to, I think, Prim. I think that's the town, P-R-I-M-M, -M, right outside of Vegas on the 10, heading towards Los Angeles. And um, I was about two or three miles south of Prim. And I suddenly felt arms around my stomach. Now, you got to remember, I'm sitting in the car. So it feels like they're coming through the back, you know, back seat and someone's putting their arms around me and hugging me from the back. And then I feel this cheek up against my cheek, like their head is right next to mine. OK, and I'm like, oh, my God, now I'm driving and I'm freaking out because I'm suddenly feeling all this. Right. And I'm like, holy crap. I'm looking around trying to see if they're, you know, if they're if I can see them. OK, that would have freaked me out even more. I think I would have crashed and killed myself. But so I'm feeling all this. And then I hear in my right ear where his cheek is, I hear, I love you. You're helping us. We love you. Thank you. And he he starts telling me he's part of the reptilian rebellion and all this stuff. I mean, it took only took about a minute to tell me all this, but I, I'm like, what? And then he said, thank you. I got to go. And then he left. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was so bizarre. And I'm like, oh, my God. So there was a rest stop. If you get past Prim on the way to bake, uh, Baker, there's a rest stop at the bottom of the hill. I pulled into the rest stop and I tell you, Charles, I was shaking like a leaf. I couldn't stop shaking. I don't know what happened. I just freaked out. I guess I went into shock and I sat there for two hours. I couldn't drive. It was it was crazy. 
Now, whether it was real or not, it was real enough to me to scare the bejesus out of me and I couldn't stop shaking, okay? So it wasn't just a thing. It, it was. Re it felt real to me. Now, whether he was actually there or not is another whole issue. But And whether I'm helping the, rep re the reptilian rebellion is another whole thing. And I, I, when it was all over, I thought, oh, God, that must be my fantasy of, uh, you know, Star Wars or something coming through. <laughs> I kept knocking. You know, I kept saying, oh, that could be real. I could be helping them or, you know, whatever. And uh, I just, it, it felt, but it was so real to me. I mean, absolutely real. And then I've talked to Misha Johnston about it afterwards and Melinda and a whole bunch of people who actually have reptilian um, guys they deal with on a regular basis and actually have seen them. But they said, you know, most of the time they just talk to them in their in their heads or, you know, in their ears. And they have had experiences where invisible reptilians will actually be with them and they can feel them. They can feel their arm. If they put their arm out, they, their hand out, they can touch their arm type of thing. Now, whether I could touch their arm, that's another whole, you know, thing up for debate. So most and, of the time, uh, most of the time when you get information from your, whoever's guiding you, is it audible or just a thought or how do you receive most of your information? I receive audible and visual. It's both. And your visual, is it like a movie picture? Are oh, you there yeah. or how's it? How's Very much. It's total movie. Yeah, total movie. Full color, everything. But yeah. you're immersed in the movie. It's not, is it a movie inside your head or is it a place where you go to? I think it's, I think they're projecting it into my head. I'm watching it like it's, it's like part of my consciousness in my head. Okay. I don't, it, it's not external to me. I can tell you that because I don't think anybody else could see it if, you know, it was happening. Sometimes it'll, I'll look up and I'll see it happening and it'll look like a big TV screen. But I and then I realize, oh, that's got to be in my head. It can't be, you know, a TV screen floating in my room or even a holographic image in my room. So. so some of your girlfriends have had my lab experiences. Did you ever get involved in any of that? Oh, yeah, <laughs> sadly. Well, no, not my lab. Um, yeah, it was a my lab experience. They 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 keep telling me it was and I keep denying it and yeah it is and uh go through that experience yeah 2014 i'm producing the super soldier mind control and targeted individual conference at the fiesta in henderson nevada and uh we had quite an extra extraordinary lineup of people which was just phenomenal and apparently this is what happened uh, every a lot of us had our rooms broken into by guys in camo outfits, and uh, they came into the rooms and drugged us, and took about fifteen of us down to the loading dock area of the hotel, and there were two rider trucks, you know, like moving trucks, and they were outfitted like surgical units inside, and we were taken and each one of us was taken into the truck and and uh, Misha actually asked uh, one of the people doing the stuff to us what they were doing and they said we're giving everybody their annual checkup now whether that's real or not I don't know maybe they were checking implants to see if they were all working you know I don't have a clue but or maybe they were checking our EEGs and our frequencies I mean who knows what they were up to but they got through all of us in about two hours. So that means they were doing about six people per truck. So that means they were taking about 15 to 20 minutes with each person. So they can do a lot in 15 or 20 minutes. They can take your blood. They can take your vitals. They can check things. They can, you know, run a it scan. All it was all humans, no aliens or what? I think it was all humans. Um, I don't know. We haven't. Nobody has said they saw an alien yet, so I think it was absolutely military. And the uniforms? Uniforms, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and oh, I'm not going to talk about any of that because 
we're trying to keep this a little a little bit on the down low even though it's been talked about quite a bit because we still have people remembering there remember there's 15 of us that got taken so um we're still having different people remember different things and we're trying not to pollute the 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 you know the visuals so that they don't get information they don't get preloaded okay so you want to know who's real who was there oh, okay so you're keeping yeah. it quiet I'm not because describe what they were wearing i'm not going to you know because those are the pieces that if you were really abducted during that time and and we pretty much know who it was and some of those people say i don't you know i wasn't and i don't know and then a few have come back to us recently and said i'm going to go get hypnotized and uh i'll t let you know what i find out you know and I, so we're just not telling them a whole lot because it's still the kind of an ongoing investigation and also there may come a point where melinda and i might write a book about it so okay so um i do remember you, you talking about that story before either you or her one one of the two of you you or um uh, or um misha or or somebody yes. else what happened that was very interesting is that a year later that that oh, i'm sorry that was at the 2013 event because in 2014 melinda got on stage and told all about the what happened to us in 2013 and uh so a bunch of the people that were involved in that abduction in 2013 were speakers at 2014 and they were in the room and they're like, that never happened. You know, it, it never happened. I don't remember Melinda. They gave Melinda a really bad time. And I was the worst offender. I told her she was crazy. She was out of her mind. It never happened. I mean, I really went after her about this, you know, and, uh, then she got me on the phone one night and she said, Lorian, you've really got to listen to me. You've got to understand something happened because she goes, I remember stuff and something really happened to me. And I said, OK, I'll listen. So I listened to her. She tells me the story. And at one point she got to the point where she was talking about how they broke into her room and her roommate, Scotty, actually knew she saw the guys breaking into the room she knew that they'd come in the room and she was not even a contactee or anything and they drugged her and knocked her out but she the next day she remembered it all happening and she's not even a ufo person nothing you know and she says weren't these guys breaking into the room last night it scared the hell out of me you know that kind of thing so um so bottom line, uh, Melinda's talking about all this and I suddenly had a memory and it really freaked me out. I remembered some guy um, leaning over me and I described to Melinda in detail what he was wearing before she told me what he was wearing. So we now both know that I, I remember that much and I remember that he had either a necklace on or dog tags or something when he was leaning over me, it kept bouncing into my cheek, you know, a necklace or something. Something was dangling and hitting me. I remember that much. And I remember the, and then I don't remember anything else. But Melinda said to me, we were standing on the loading dock and you were right next to me. And we were both leaning and she, oh, I said, oh my God, we were leaning up against the concrete wall behind us. She goes, yeah, we were. And I said, I had both my hands behind my back. She goes, I don't know. But if that, and I said, I can feel the cold concrete on my hands. So I know that I was standing next to you, Melinda. So that, that was something I did remember. And then the other part I remembered, no, I didn't remember this, but she said at that moment when we were leaning up against the wall, I turned to you and I said, um, uh, this is a crazy and i looked at her and i said yeah no one's ever gonna believe it <laughs> and that's exactly what i would say i i would turn to her and i would say something just like that and she said it just like i would say it so i knew that uh, that i probably responded to her in that in that mode so that's what convinced me that i may have been you know wrong about this whole thing and then right after that misha went and got regressed and a couple other people that were involved got regressed and they all started having memories and we purposely did not tell them 
you know, anything in detail up until that point. And then when they all came back to us and said, oh, my God, here's some more details for you and, you know, whatever. So if we ever do write the book, it's going to be pretty interesting because it'll be from at least 10 other people's viewpoint as well. So. So. Besides that, uh, what you've said so far, what what other. Uh, very interesting experiences have you had that you'd like to relate? Well, I think um, I'd like to tell you a bit about my dead boyfriend. <laughs> that was always interesting to me. Um, I was um, with a guy who killed himself, um, and I, it, was, it hit me really hard. I mean, I, I spent a year crying every day, and it was it was tough at the time. But when, when I went for his memorial, now he was 20 years older than I was, and he already had kids that were my age. So it was kind of interesting. But I went to um, his hometown where his kids were, and his ex-wife, uh, her and I had become friends in his death, which is even weirder. But long story short, I'm at her house with her kids, and we're having a big memorial service the next day um, for him. And uh, it was people were just freaked out about the fact that his wife and his girlfriend were both at the <laughs> at the funeral. But yeah, that's another whole story. Um, but I'm there with him and his daughter says, oh, you can sleep in my room. And I said, great, I got a sleeping bag in the car. I'll just throw it out and we'll bunk together. And she goes, great. So that night we fall asleep and um, I am laying in the sleeping bag and I look up in the sleeping bag and I think I'm dreaming because I see my dead boyfriend standing at the foot of my sleeping bag and he's holding a painting of he was an artist and he's holding one of his paintings and he kept saying Lorraine you've got to do your art you've got to do your art and he kept pointing to his painting and uh, at that time I was a professional dancer and I was going to quit I had had a really his death really hit me hard and I was going to quit everything I was doing and he kept telling me you've got to you know, you've got to do your art. And and he told me a few other things he was sorry about. And while I'm laying there, I realized I'm awake and my eyes are open. <laughs> so I'm like, this isn't a dream. I'm, you know, I'm awake and my eyes are open. So I'm seeing him standing there. The next day, I'm at breakfast with his daughter and I come into the room. She's already sitting at the table. And she goes, Lorian, Lorian. Dad came to me last night and I said, where was it? I said, how? In a dream? Oh, now, I didn't tell this part. When I was laying there with my eyes open, I realized she was in the bed next to me. And she was, she had just sat up. At the same time, I realized my eyes were open. She sat up in bed. So I knew she had sat up in bed, but I acted like I was asleep. So, you know, she didn't talk to me afterwards. She just went back to sleep. So the next morning, she... um says dad came to me last night dad came to me last night and i said really i said what what do you look like she goes, he was standing at the foot of your sleeping bag and he told me a whole bunch of stuff he said i'm gonna have a baby boy and i'm gonna get married and i'm gonna do you know all this stuff and he's really sad he couldn't be there with me and she you know all these great uplifting great things he told her and i said oh my that's so weird i said he came i saw him standing there but he wasn't telling me that he was talking to me all about my art and his art and uh, what i needed to do and where i needed to go and you know and she goes oh that's so great so we both saw his ghost at the same time both of us were awake both of us had our eyes open and he was telling us two completely different things so I thought that was interesting because very seldom do people, when they see a ghost, first of all, get communication that clearly and for that long. It would last about a minute for both of us. And to have him talk two different complete realities at the same time, I thought that was really cool. So um, I haven't heard of anybody else having that kind of experience. Okay, well, that's, that is a pretty amazing story. Uh what else would you like to discuss? Let's see. Um, well, I talked about the rabbit that, oh, God, I got this great story about uh, smoking pot and going over a cliff. <laughs> and almost dying. This one's good. Um, 
my boyfriend at the time and myself and a guy named Robert and my girlfriend in the back seat and two other guys and I can't remember their names right now. So in the front seat is driving is my boyfriend. I'm in the middle. My Robert friend is sitting on the passenger side in the back seat. We got the same thing. Two guys and a girl in the middle in the back seat of my boyfriend's parents station wagon. We decide to skip school and go up to this place called Washougal uh, Park up in Washington. I'm living in Portland, Oregon. We drive up to Vancouver. We go out to Washougal, Washington, and there's a park there with the falls. And, you know, we went hiking and then we, um, oh, we got pretty stoned before we went hiking. And then we got in the car. Now, I didn't smoke much pot. These guys are smoking like, you know, a whole joint themselves. I take two hits and I couldn't take any more because I'm just not, I'm not a good pot smoker, you guys. I just never have been. And it's never been my thing. I, I get too spaced out, too bizarre, and I just fly off into another dimension. So I just don't do it. You know, never, never really did. But they were all pretty stoned out of their minds. And we get back to the car. Now they, they've calmed down since. They're not quite as stoned or anything. But I had a troll doll that I had hung in the mirror on the off of the mirror that was my car protector for him because he's he's a crazy driver and I thought he'd get killed someday so I put my troll doll in his car as his protector and he was still alive at that point so there you go and they decided to smoke a joint before they left we left and uh Robert the guy sitting next to me took a big hit of pot and blew it on my troll doll uh, he got the troll doll stoned in my mind. I said, I said, Robert, what are you doing? I said, that troll doll's protecting Tony. I said, you can't do this. Why did you do this? I was so upset. And, and as I said this, I see us all rolling down a hill in the car, head over head over head over head. That's all I see. And I, I'm having this total vision. I'm like, oh, my God, we're all going to die. And I said, you can't. I said, God, why did you do that? I said, no one's leaving here until you put your seatbelts on. And I grabbed the car keys. So I made nobody wore their seatbelt back then. OK, this is this. This is 1972 or three, something like that. And I said, everybody puts on their seatbelts. And, and seatbelts had just gotten in the cars like 10 years before that, right? So, Or maybe 20, I don't know. But no one wore them. You didn't have to. And they were pretty cumbersome back then. And so I would not leave. I had the keys. I got out of the car. I said, we're not leaving here until everybody puts their seatbelts on. And we fought for like 20 minutes. Everybody's like, no, I'm not putting my seatbelt on. Are you crazy? And they keep smoking pot. And they're like, whatever. I said, well, I'm fine. We'll sit here all night till tomorrow. I'm not giving you the car keys. We're not leaving until you guys put your seatbelts on. So reluctantly and finally, everybody got back in the car, put their seatbelts on, and then we start driving. Okay, about 10 minutes into the drive, my stupid boyfriend, I don't know why, decided to pass a guy going pretty slow on a curve in the rain. And we start, and now we're along the Washougal River. Now, what I can tell you guys is there is 250 to 500 foot drops straight down to the river down a canyon along this whole river. And so Tony lost control of the car and he was trying to push it into the mountainside, but it, it spun off the mountain and went not head over heels down the mountain, down the cliff into the river, but sideways down the cliff into the river. So we're, we're rolling and rolling and rolling, and thank God everybody had their seatbelts on or they would have all been thrown through the you know, front window or they, they would have been dead, you know, prop, most likely. And here's the kicker. About 50 feet down the hill, there is one tree big enough to hold the weight of the car and all of us in it. And that's for a, probably a quarter of a mile to the right and at least a half a mile to the left. It's the only tree on that whole bank as far as you can see. Literally, the, the rest are all little shrubs, okay? This is the only tree, 
and we end up rolling right into it and balancing on it. <laughs> it was a miracle. I mean, a, a freaking miracle. And we got out of the car slowly, very, you know, first of all, it says everybody okay. And then, and I said, don't move. Every I, And everybody just didn't move. I mean, they all, at that point, they were all like, Okay, she told us we were all going to die if we didn't put our seatbelts on. So now we're all hanging in midair by our seatbelts. And I'm like, don't move. So um, nobody's moving. The car's kind of rocking. And I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Robert was on the slope side and my other friend was on the slope side. I said, you guys are going to crawl, roll down your windows and crawl out the windows first then me and uh, my other friend are going to go, the other woman with us. And then finally I said, uh, Tony, since you got us in this mess, you're going last. And so the, we all crawled out and we all crawled up the hill and we were bloodied and banged up and, you know, what have you. But we were all alive. So there you go. Another psychic premonition coming true. So. I think I remember hearing you tell that story before also. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I just, you know, it, 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 thank God everybody's still alive. I would have hate to have seen six kids die in a car accident like that. That would have been ugly. It would have been horrible for all the parents, you know, just ugly. So anyhow, so there you go. That's my stone troll doll story. So what <laughs> other alien stories you got? Oh, alien. Well, I have this one. I, I, I never really talk about it too much, but <laughs> I'm going to talk about it now. I don't know if it's military. I don't know if it's good aliens. I don't know if it's reptilians or grays. I don't know who did this to me because, again, I kept my eyes closed the whole time. Um, I'm asleep, and I get woken up, and I get told I have to keep my eyes closed. And I'm like, okay, fine, no problem. I don't see anything in the room at that time. I just hear his voice. You've got to keep your eyes closed. I'm like, okay. I will, no problem, because I don't really, you know, like I said, I don't want to see scary things, so I'm always good about keeping my eyes closed. So the next thing I know, I'm not in the house. I know that I'm not in the house. I'm somewhere else, and it may be that they took me and I don't remember it or whatever, but the next thing I know, I'm not in the house. And they said, keep your eyes closed. I said, I am, I am, keep my eyes closed. And they said, now look, we've got to do a procedure, and if we don't do it, you're going to die. And I said, what? And they said, if we don't do this, you're going to die. Now, this was during the time I was having all those liver problems, okay? And I thought, well, you know what? I'm not feeling too good anyhow, so what the heck? And they said, yeah, we have to do it or you're going to die. Can we do it? They actually asked me permission to do a procedure. And I was like, holy crap. I said, I said, sure, go for it. I never, I'll never forget it because I said, sure, go for it. <laughs> It was like, okay, why not, you know? And the next thing I know, I'm naked and I'm in this weird stainless steel kind of contraption seat. And I'm sitting in a seat where my thighs and my shins are, or back, my calves are, have metal underneath them. And my arms and my back down to my butt have metal underneath them, but the complete part around my butt area is all exposed. And I can feel it because it, it doesn't have anything on it, right? It's all totally exposed. And I'm like, well, okay, this is weird, right? It's like sitting on the toilet, basically. And I was like, okay, this is really strange. And the next thing I know is I think, I got to open my eyes and see what the heck is going on, okay? I start to open my eyes and I see a big, not a big tube, but a tube about an inch in diameter, maybe a little bigger, but probably an inch. And it has orange stuff in it that looks like orange sherbet ice cream, but it's sparkling all the way through it, like sparkly, just totally neon sparkling. I'm like, what the heck is this? And as I try to open my, now I, it's really hard to open my eyes. They ap apparently put this suggestion in my brain that I'm not supposed to open them. So I don't, I mean, it's like they, or they won't, you know, physically. 
but I'm really trying hard and I got them open enough to see this thing coming at my, my mouth. And I realized my mouth is totally open and it's got something holding it open. Okay. And I'm like, holy crap. And the next thing I know, they're pushing this tube down my throat and it is going into my stomach and with force and the next thing I know, and I call this the big rinse because it's coming out the other end of me and it hurt really, really bad. And I blacked out at that point when I realized what was happening. I was terrified. OK, I woke up the next day and I felt like I'd been hit by a Mack truck and I was not hungry for like three days. Um, I was very thirsty, though. I drank a lot of water and I went to the doctor about six weeks later and he said, I can't believe it, but your liver enzymes are all looking back to normal. He goes, I don't know what's going on with you. So apparently, whoever these ETs were, they actually physically healed me at the time. So it was pretty amazing. And why they had to do it that way, I have no clue because I've never heard of anybody else having this. And I wrote Whitley, I wrote Ann Streber at the time. This happened when I was like 29 or 30. So that was what, 45 years ago. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 35 years ago. And I wrote Ann Streber at the time. And I said, have you ever heard of this happening to anybody? And she wrote back and said, I'm sorry, but I've never heard of anything like this. And, and years later, I found out, I talked to a bunch of uh, super soldier type people, and they've said that they have had the same kind of tube type of into their body with colored liquids gone through them also. Um, or they've had to drink it or, you know, different types of things like that. Mostly blue and green, uh, not really orange. There's been some yellows, um, but, you know, who knows what this is all about. I don't even know if it was real, but I'll tell you something. <laughs> it hurt like hell. So I I, 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 mean, I really felt the pain and it made me almost pass out. I know they knocked me out at that point. Um, but man, it was as real as the day is long for me, you know, and it did help improve my health. So who knows? You know where that letter's at today? What, the letter to Ann Streber? Uh-huh. Uh, I'm thinking it's an email, actually. Oh, okay. I may not have written, I may have uh, written an email, and I think somewhere in my archives of my emails, I have a response. Uh, he, he donated all of his writings to the, to the, uh, I guess it was a college in Houston. Oh, right. did I guess he? It was oh, Rice good. University. One of, one of the colleges he donated all this uh, big boxes of all, all the things that were, you know, all those letters that communion letters and all that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. No, she got thousands. I think this was in the early days of email. I really think I emailed it. I had written quite a few letters of other things, you know, before that time. So I may have written a letter. And if I did, then it, that's where it, it's going to end up, you know. But I think it might have been email. But, you know, I've been in touch with him many times over the years, so I, I'm not sure. But anyhow, point is, I did write Anne and, uh, in some way, shape, or form, and I did get a response that she didn't had, hadn't heard of stuff like that. Sure. But she was very polite, and she did say, um, you know, you never know what E.T. can do. I mean, you know, every one of it. And here's the cool part. After she wrote me that letter, I finally realized, Jesus, you know, these are really personal experiences. I mean, they're very personal. It's hard for people to talk about them. I never talked about this, you know, until I was, until about five years ago. I never told anybody what they did to me because I thought, you know, who wants to hear something this personal? This is kind of weird, you know? So, you know, maybe there's other people out there that have had a similar experience, but they're not talking about it. You know, so, it is, yeah. What, Go what's ahead. your near-death experience like? Uh, well, the, the, I think the most amazing near-death experience I had that is when I was a baby. You know, this was the one told to me by my grandmother. Um, when I was 18 months old, ish i was crawling and kind of walking uh, already i guess 18s when you start walking i guess but i was kind of crawling and walking 
and uh, my parents and my grandmother on my dad's side of the family went to the beach to stay at this guy's cabin. There was a business partner of my dad's. And they left a note on the counter that said, we know you got a dollar that's crawling. Um, we have rat poison all over the house. So go around and pick up all the pie tins before you let her loose, basically. And so they thought they had gotten all of them picked up. And they put them on, you know, on top of the cupboards or did something with them. And my dad went into under underneath the stairs in a lot of cabins is where they store the wood to keep it dry. And my dad opened the bottom cupboard door the under the stairs and um he was getting the wood out and I crawled in there and crawled to the back apparently. And in the back of that area where they didn't see was a big pie tin full of warfin and I started eating it. I ate a lot <laughs> apparently, but by the time they found me and realized what I had done, my mother rinsed my mouth out and said, Oh, she's probably fine. She probably didn't eat enough to hurt herself. And my grandmother took one look at me and she's psychic and she knew what the heck was going on. And she said, no, we're going to the hospital right now. She's going to die. So immediately, because my dad knew when my grandmother said something like that, it was probably gonna, probably real and going to happen. And so they all jumped back in the car and drove all the way back to Portland to St. Vincent's Hospital. They get me in the hospital and they start pumping my stomach and giving me um, charcoal. Apparently they used to give charcoal or something. I don't know what they were doing. But anyhow, by the time they got me there, um, the warfin had started breaking down my blood vessels. And I was it looked like I was bruised all over, apparently. And uh, who knows that that wasn't the cause of my liver problems later, because apparently warfin starts melting your organs so that probably what was going on with the liver thing later. That's what my doctor kind of thought at a different point. But anyhow, so long story short, uh, they told my parents, we don't know if we got enough out of her before it was digested to save her life. We'll know by the morning. And uh, so they said there's a 50-50 you know, chance she's going to die tonight. So my parents were really upset. My grandmother was freaking out, but... My grand, my parents had to go like either to or home to change clothes or home for some reason, or they had to go down to the main office and fill out forms. I don't know what it was. All I know is they had to leave the room for some length of time. They said to my grandmother, be sure you stay awake. We don't want her to die without somebody with, with her loving, you know, loving on her, right? Basically, they probably said something other to that effect. But my grandmother told me that was pretty much it. You know, don't let her die alone, basically. So my grandmother was sitting by the crib, you know, right next to it, and had her hands on me. And she starts falling asleep. And as she's falling asleep, she sees a, an angel over the crib and it was the same angel that came into their farmhouse when she was 13 years old, dying from scarlet fever. And the angel told her when she was 13, you're not going to die. You've got work to do, basically. And um, you're going to be fine. And don't worry about it. You, you know, you're going to be fine, whatever. And so she saw the same angel. And he came to her and, and said... I'm now Lorian's guardian angel. She's going to be fine. Don't worry about her. She's got work to do. That kind of thing. And so my grandmother fell asleep holding me. My parents come into the room. They are flipped out. They started yelling at my grandmother for falling asleep. And my dad didn't talk to her for like two months after that. She never told them what happened. But she got up when they got mad at her. And she said, well, I'm going home. So she called her husband at the time and came and got her and went home. And so that's why I think my dad was pretty pissed off about that. But <laughs> whatever. Anyhow, so that's what happened. And uh, I don't remember that as my near-death experience, but it's a shared near-death experience from my grandmother's near-death experience when she was 13 and mine at 18 months old, being told to me by her. 
She should have told your dad about the angel. Nah, because my dad was not. He still, I mean, to the day he died, you know, I I got to tell you a funny story. When I About two years ago, I went home for a visit, and it was when the disclosure stuff was happening. And I think it was 2019 that the they was going to the Senate. Remember all that? The big brouhaha. And it was the first time the Senate had had, oh, it was when Favor, you know, Captain Favor went on uh, Tucker Carlson and 60 Minutes and all that. Yeah. Yeah. My dad watched that. And I came home and I finally, and I said to him, I said, aha. He goes, well, you've been telling me for, you know, 65, you know, since you were a kid that these guys are all real and UFOs are real. And he goes, now I guess you're right, you know. So I finally got my vindication that uh, my father finally realized that I wasn't crazy, you know, and that felt good. So at least he did that for me before I di- before he died. So I was happy about that. So you've never been, other than the time you were with God, that one time you've never been on the other side, have you? Well, I think that time that that angel was standing by the bed, that light being, and took me to see God, I'm pretty sure I was dead at that point. Because I felt, I can't describe how bad I felt when I got back. I mean, it was it was bad. You're talking I mean, about after the after the aliens uh, flushed you out. That one? We're talking different experience here. No, the, the 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 flushing happened after the time that the angel was by the bed and took me to the place of love and light. That's how I described that story. I'm pretty sure that was a near-death experience involving a white light being of an angel quality, you know. Okay. I'm pretty sure. I mean, who knows? You know, I, here's the kicker on all this, Charles. From all the communication I've gotten over the years and all the 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 lessons they've taught me, the things they've done with me, the, you know, the different types of consciousness experiments we've run together, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um it really comes down to your ability to accept the fact that they have complete control of your consciousness and how much you're willing to stand your ground with them in, in becoming an equal. And I really believe that. Um, there's a movie out called Midnight Special. Have you ever seen it about the little boy? I don't think so. Oh, I I encourage you and all your audience to watch this because I think it is absolutely what is going on in the universe right now. Uh, I don't want to give it away because it's so, to me, the end of the movie is so profound because it, it, it shows what's really going on here. And what could be very simply this, Charles, is that there are many, many dimensions of different types of beings that we communicate with all the time, but we just don't even understand it or or know. It's like, you know, God talking to an ant. And th- that's my feeling about the whole alien connection, the whole psychic phenomena, the whole angels, the ascended masters, the plagiarans, the, you know, whatever. They're all living in different dimensions or timelines or whatever you want to call it. And there are just some of us that, that get tweaked by them at some point, or we are born with the the DNA ability to connect with them. And that's how we become a beacon to them showing up for us, you know? And I do think it, a lot of it has to do with intergenerational uh, genetics. Anyway, that's my opinion. So you said you kind of alluded earlier that you knew who was who the aliens were that was guiding you and uh giving you all the information but you never well, mentioned i, it. I had know. a good friend named cynthia crawford do you remember cynthia uh the name so sounds true. really familiar but i'm probably yeah. the wrong person she was truly amazing she did the alien sculptures and she was oh yeah like, yeah i remember her yeah. yeah 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 she died about three or four years ago from a brain tumor and she's absolutely phenomenal and i didn't know her well but we've known each other for a long time oh and i will tell you one story about her quickly she spoke at my uh 20 
six, 17 conference in Sacramento. And Barbara Lamb, uh, her two other women and I were chatting up at our party room. We were having a speaker's party. And the th I turned away for a fraction of a second to grab a drink off of a table. And in that moment, I heard Barbara go, <gasps> And then she goes, what are you thinking right now? And I turn back around and I see Cynthia Crawford's eyes go from a slit to normal. The, you know, the center of them. They were in a slit formation like a reptilian. Then they go back to center. And apparently right before, just as I turned to grab my drink and Barbara, ex, you know, made that sucking air sound, her eyes turned into reptilian eyes right in front of her and two other, you know, two other women. So three women saw the eyes go into reptilian eyes and change back. And I caught it as it was changing back. And and Cynthia said, oh, you know, I, I feel pressure in the back of my eyes. I just never knew that was it. She goes, well, what are you thinking right now? And Cynthia says, oh, I was thinking about my son and I was worried he was, you know, I'm worried about him right now. There's something going on and she didn't want to get personal, but she goes, yeah, I'm, I'm under a lot of stress right now. And I just thought about him because of something you, you just said. And she's like, oh my God, she goes, your eyes changed and everybody saw it. I mean, it wasn't like it was just, it just happened. There were four of us that saw it. So it was, you know, pretty amazing. I got to tell you. So from that moment on, I was like, Cynthia, you're, you know, you're a reptilian hybrid or something. She's like, oh, I don't think I'm reptilian. And yeah, we always joked about it. So um, she's getting very sick. Uh, the year before she died, she's getting sick and she's calling me every once in a while. And she goes, you know, my guys keep telling me to call you because there's something I need to tell you. And I don't know what it is. <laughs> and we always laugh about it. Then right before she died, she ended up in the hospital. And she says her whole room at the hospital was full of these um, alien humans talking to her all the time about what she was going to do in her next phase and this and that and whatever. And I hadn't talked to her for about four or five months. And she calls me like three days before she dies. And she goes, Lorian, I just got through talking to my buddies on the ship, you know, outside the planet that are, you know, monitoring us from another dimension. She goes, I'm going back there. That's where I'm going when I die this time. And I want you to know you're actually on that ship right now. And you're and you as an avatar are now down here on this planet doing work, you know, and I'm like, holy crap. I said, work. I said, is that the word they use? She goes, yep, that's the exact word they use. So I was laughing because I'm like, every time they kick me back or every time I deal with them, they always go, you've got work to do. And I'm like, oh God, I don't want to hear that word. She goes, yeah, your, your, your Plajaran body is in a, in a tank up there on the ship. And you're actually chose to do this mission of coming down here to help raise the consciousness of the, you know, whatever. And I'm like, oh, seriously? She goes, yep. She goes, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but um, you're actually one of the, the people on the ship that's working with me and helping run the whole show here down on the planet. And I said, no way. I, you know, I honestly, Charles, I don't believe her, but... If that's what she got, you know, I, who am I to argue? And it makes sense. I mean, I would be the one that would volunteer to come down here and work, you know. I'm always, that's the kind of person I am. So it makes sense that if I was actually a Plajaran in that existence, that I would do something like that, you know, because that's just kind of who I am. I like to do, I'm a doer. I've always said that. I'm one of these people who just does. People always ask, how did you have so many jobs? How did you have so many careers? You know, have you done all, you know, done all this stuff? I go, because I can't sit still for five minutes and I'd rather do three jobs than none at all. You know, I'd be a terrible drug addict. We always laugh about that. <laughs> so you think the aliens you're in touch with are really you at another level? That's right. Absolutely. So you're basically and talking I to yourself. It, yeah, yeah, but I'm not talking to me up there. I mean, I don't think so. I'm talking to the, 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 the community, you know. But I mean, what, what I'm saying is the aliens that are guiding you now is really you at a different level. 
Yeah, Maybe. possibly. I, I'm starting to believe that. Yeah. I think we all have avatars like that. I think it's very, and I never even saw the Avatar movie. I, I've never seen it, but I can tell you I already know what it's like because I, I think that's how it's been and how I've been thinking about it since Cynthia told me that. And even before Cynthia told me that, and the lady came through the wall, part of me thought, oh my God, this is me, you know, in another whole existence. And I'm just like, oh my God. And um, that could be it. But when you're dealing with that type of situation, Charles, it's not like you're dealing with yourself. You're actually dealing with the, the, the community consciousness because they can't just they. In other words, I'm in stasis somewhere, right? If this is true, what Cynthia's telling me about that ship is true. I mean, it's huge. Apparently, it's the biggest mothership we got out there. She told me all kinds of details I don't want to go into right now. But bottom line is there are thousands and thousands of people on this that are like Plajaran or Plajoran or I don't know what they are. She never did really give me the name. But... Bottom line, they're very humanoid, but they all have psychic abilities. They all have telepathic communication. They, you know, they're from a different galaxy, apparently. Um, and, uh, you know, so bottom line is if we're, when you're in stasis on that ship, from my experience here on Earth right now, if that's all true, then what I'm picking up is the consciousness of the, of the community and, their type of direction more than I'm picking up anything from one individual entity. Right. Okay? I got you. Yeah. So, and I think, and I think it has to be that way. You know, if I was communicating with myself as a different being on an, on a ship outside, that would be very confusing for anybody. <laughs> we'll, you know, probably <laughs> confusing for you too. Yeah, it'd be confusing for all of us, you know. So, but Cynthia was very insistent about this. She was, you know, flat out like, Lorian, this is the way it is. And and you're working with me on the ship. And, you know, there's all this stuff. And I volunteered too. And, you know, that's why when we met each other uh, the very first time years ago, we were like instant sisters. I mean, I just, I knew everything about her. She knew everything about me. It was crazy. If it's true, you know, it would explain that. Well, it's no crazier than anything else. I mean, that's just, true. That is true. Just to know. So, um, how are we doing on time? Uh, hour and 35 minutes. How much time do you need? Uh, well, I, I'm not time based. I go as long as my, uh, as the talker wants to talk. We could oh, talk for six one. hours if you okay. want to talk for six hours. Well, I, I would like to tell about the time that I my tongue got lasered. That was kind of an interesting little Go for it. Um I was at that conference where we all got in in the uh, rider trucks, that event. And this what this is what bothered me more, you know, later on hearing about us all being abducted, you know, by the military. I was like, ah, you know, that that bothered me, but it didn't bother me as much as this bothered me, this story. When that conference was over, I was going back to uh, San Francisco, but I had a friend with me and he was driving back to San Francisco too. And I had another friend that was driving to Elko, Nevada. And I thought, well, shoot, why don't the three of us, since we're all driving away from here together at the same time, why don't we go up to the little alien and Rachel and spend the night there and look for UFOs, you know? So the two of them said, yeah, why not? And Elko was on the way, you know, past the Rachel and uh, the other guy and I could go back to the 95 and head on over to, uh, 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 well, I can't remember the name of the city, but we would head there and then head north and get up to Reno, spend the night in Reno and then hit uh, down San Francisco the next day. So that's what we decided to do. And so we're up at the Little Alien. Now we're in this big, uh, I don't know if anybody's been there, but the place is so run down, so disgusting. The trailer you're in is, it's a mobile home trailer and it's just disgusting. <laughs> so I can describe it, but it doesn't cost much and it's worth the, you know, the night to be there. I, I had the room in the back. What they had is a bathroom in the middle 
and a bedroom in the back and a, a like a living room area with two beds in it in the front. So my two buddies were sleeping in the front. I'm in the back bedroom and my air and there's doors obviously that close between these two areas going to the bathroom area in the middle. And I we had gone out looking for UFOs, didn't see any, you know, we were just and it was four o'clock in the morning when we got back. Um, and I went to bed and I realized the air conditioner didn't work. I turned it on. I'm boiling. It's like, you know, it's it's February, but it's still hot, too hot for me. And. Um, oh, no, actually, it was May. I'm sorry. I got the wrong year. Uh, it was May. So I try to turn it on. I can't turn it on. So I open the bedroom window and like a crazed idiot, there's a back door out to the desert uh there and my car's parked kind of in that area you can see my car there their car was in the front and um i parked mine in back so i can get my luggage in easier so anyhow long story short i opened both doors i opened the back door to the desert and i opened my bedroom door and i'm laying there and the next thing i know it's like eight or nine o'clock in the morning and i wake up and i go to swallow and I can't swallow because the pain is so immense that I it's just mind boggling the pain. I mean, I'm telling you, unbelievable pain. It, it, every time my tongue moved, I felt like I was going to die. It was that painful. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell? So I get up, I go to the bathroom and I'm lifting my tongue because I know something's wrong under my tongue. I can't see it though, because my eyes were getting bad at the time and I couldn't get close enough to the mirror. And you know, I needed a magnifying glass, I mean, a, a magnifying mirror and a flashlight basically is what I needed. And I didn't have them. And I'm like, I'm in agony. I'm telling you, I couldn't swallow. I couldn't do anything. The, so I'm like, what the hell happened to me? And I didn't know. Luckily enough, I am prescribed uh, 10 Vicodin a month for my migraines, and I hadn't had a couple, I hadn't had a migraine yet that month. So I popped a Vicodin just so I could not be dying in pain. And then every six hours for the next day and a half until I got home, I'm doing the same thing and I'm driving. Yeah, that's how, that's how bad the pain was because people go, oh man, you can't take Vicodin and drive, you'll fall asleep. I always fall asleep on them, right? But this pain was so profoundly bad that it got me to almost normal, but not even quite. I was still in pain, okay? Every time I moved my tongue, I thought I, I mean, with the pills, I could move it, but it was very, still painful, okay? I mean, that's how bad it was, you guys. I, how else can I explain this? It was horrific pain. And so I drank a cup of hot tea that kind of helped a bit. I start driving, we get to Reno. And uh, we spend the night and I'm still, I mean, I'm up every two hours just praying to God and drinking hot tea and going, what the hell happened to me? I finally get home the next day and the pain is subsiding just a hair. I'm almost out of Vicodin. <laughs> I mean, it's bad. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I get in the house and I say to my roommate, you've got to get, go get your magnifying mirror, get a flashlight, hold it up so I can see what the hell happened to me. And we take the, he holds the, the flashlight. I got the mirror. He kind of lifts my tongue up for me, grabs a, you know, a tissue paper and stuff and pulls up my tongue. And I see two holes going down into the, I, it's not, you know, your palate's the top part. I don't know what the bottom part is, right where your tongue connects. On two sides of right where your tongue connects, there are two holes the size of like cigarettes. And it's, you can see it's bright red and it looks burnt, like a cigarette burn. And it's um, pretty deep. I mean, probably a quarter of an inch. And it's symmetrical, perfectly even. I thought they might have used a device like a taser on me, under my tongue, to burn it in. I couldn't figure out how they did it, but realizing that this is what happened to me, I got burned, like, down deep into that, that area of your mouth. Oh, my God, you guys, you have no idea how painful it is. And the minute I realized it had been done to me, I hear a voice in my head as clear as a bell. It's a male voice. And he says, we told you not to talk. 
And that's that. And then at that point, I realized that these guys, these mind control people, these satanic military people, who knows what, but this is all during the time we'd gotten taken onto the rider trucks. I mean, God knows what these people are. They, they could they, voice the school communication right in my head. We told you not to talk. And I'm like, holy crap, what have I done? You know, what have I created? <laughs> so I, you know, at that point, I'm starting to think I might be in the wrong line of work. <laughs> so just throw that tidbit out for everybody. Well, um, my one abductee client, uh, she was freaking out the whole time she was on board with the Greys. And, but uh, in the end, um, she, the, one of the last things she told me was that she was more afraid of humans than aliens. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I totally agree with her. I mean, I, for several months after that, that particular conference, I was looking for bombs under my car. And that was also the time that, that six months after that conference were very dark for me. I, I really was questioning reality on many levels at that point and that's when i called jordan maxwell i really thought they were going to kill me and i called jordan maxwell one day and i said how are you still alive and he goes oh i was waiting for you to call me and ask me that question i was wondering how long it was going to take <laughs> you know and i'm like well okay so i'm an idiot i've known you for uh, five years now and now i'm finally calling with that question and uh, he said, uh, well, you got to pray to God to save you. I said, what do you mean pray to God to save me? Are you nuts? I mean, what? I mean, come on, really? And he goes, yeah, if you don't do it, you're not going to survive this. He goes, that's, that is the reason many people fail is because they don't understand that this is a spiritual battle. And I was like, okay. I go, what do I do? He goes, you go out into the woods or wherever you feel comfortable screaming a lot where no one can hear you and you start screaming to God to, to protect you and save you. And I said, seriously? And he goes, yep, that's what you do. He goes, you'll know when it happens. I go, well, what happened for you when you knew it happened? He goes, I had been talking to God for about two weeks and or longer. I think it took him a month, I think. And he goes, then one night I'm laying in bed and angel Michael appears by the side of my bed with a flaming sword and told me he would protect me and that's why i'm still alive and i said really he goes yep absolutely i said okay i'll see what happens and so for about two weeks i'm out in my backyard screaming a lot and uh and begging and you know the whole nine yards then one day i'm sitting in my computer and i feel that same feeling i felt when i was praying for the the rabbit it overtakes my body. I feel totally at peace. I feel totally loved. I feel timeless. I feel it's just, it's an amazing feeling. I don't know how to describe it. People call it Kundalini. There's, you know, so many names for it, you know, and I felt this energy running up my body and down my body. And I just, you know, I felt amazing. And I see in my mind's eye, I did not see them physically, but it was okay because I don't think they would have fit in the room anyhow um giant angels and that's the only thing i'm going to describe i'm not going to go into detail about how they look because they're my angels and i don't want to deal with that but i got two of them and uh, they've been protecting me ever since and uh, and i was told how to deal with them and how to talk to them and you know the whole nine yards and that's why i'm still here and in that moment i understood that there is a true evil on this planet that is causes all the strife the problems and whatever we got and we are truly in a spiritual battle it's that simple and uh it, it it it's a lot of work and i do whatever i can to fight that battle you know whether it has to do with ets or vaccines or you know whatever it may be i'm on some battlefront battling it whenever i can be and uh, I'm, lot, I'm many many times behind the scenes um yeah, and I'm not going to tell you guys all what I do, but basically that's where I go and where I hang out is behind the scenes 
and and I feel it's truly a spiritual battle. And you know, the ETs are all part of this too. We have ETs that are probably helping the evil side, and I think we've got ETs that are helping the good side. You know. Well, my client, um, you know, even though she was freaking out, she was uses a breeder for the grays, but um, mm -hmm. e even though she was freaking out on board with those guys, she said, you know, in the end. Um, I'm more afraid of humans dissecting me than aliens. Oh, yeah. And she said it just like those are her words, <laughs> dissecting. I, I, hey, you, you tell her I'm right in there with her and I'm praying for her. Because, you know, these guys can be just nasty, just horribly nasty. And, uh, yeah, you know. And, and, you know, that's the other thing. I don't think people need to be as afraid of the greys as we have been. I mean, there's so many people, and I feel so sorry for them. I, I hear these people that are contactees or abductees or whatever you want to call them all the time that have been on a table and had experiments done to them and all these things. But in the end, the ET wipes your, your memory of it, and it's just like being under anesthesia. You don't remember what they did to you. And they never really have done anything to any of my friends or anybody I know that is truly horrific ever, you know, it may seem horrific at the time, but they all come back with their limb, limbs and legs. And many of them have a very spiritually profound life now because of their contact with ET and are well, closer to God. When I was on NASA base before the first space shuttle launch and it was, uh, five in the morning, five thirty in the morning, dark, and we're going on. Uh, you know the tr the traffic is flowing across. Uh, you know on the base towards the launch site. The craft that appeared uh, when I asked for it to appear. Um, the little boy and girl to my left. And the little boy behind me, you know, they'd been looking around at everything. But the, the second this thing appeared, it was like they got shot by Mr. Freeze Ray. They did not see the craft. They were totally frozen and uh, did not move a muscle, not, not even their eyeballs. And uh, so whatever was in that craft apparently didn't want the kids to see it the adults mm -hmm. saw it the the passenger and the adult sitting in the front seat of the of the station wagon saw the craft but the kids were like all frozen and so whatever these whatever was in that craft uh, i guess didn't want children to have that experience now that wouldn't be the kind of creature that would abduct people and and uh, put them under great pain that would be a yes. different whatever was in that craft was not that type of alien and uh, but the additional piece of information was that uh, or along these lines was that as soon as the adults agreed that the craft was sitting there and all the cars uh, you know went under it and everything as soon as they agreed, yeah, uh, the the, um, the guy driving the father of the kids said maybe that's what he saw, and the passenger, the young twenty-ish uh, kid, said yeah, maybe that is what he saw, and then after they both said those things, from that moment for or instant forward, they didn't. Uh, acknowledged that it existed from that moment forward. It was right. That it right. was like it was no longer there, or they didn't care about it anymore, or it was out of their mind. They acknowledged it existed, and then, or that was sitting there, and then instantly they don't care. They're not looking at it. There's nothing, you know. Yeah, I remember you telling this story on my show. I, I, I was fascinated by it. You got a ride with them, correct? Yeah, the father, well, um, I 
my father um, owned a couple of pre-production um, fiberglass vets before they before the Corvette was ever the first year the Corvette was steel, and the second year was fiberglass. And before the first fiberglass version of the vet was produced for public consumption, he owned prior to that a pre-production version of the of the vet. I don't know how he got it, but uh, um, they hadn't deacidized the the the, the uh, fiberglass body. It bubbled up, and they had to kept repainting it. And anyway, oh wow, uh, co cops would stop him and give him tickets. Just to just to see the car, even though even when he wasn't speeding, right? And, uh, just so they could see what the car was, and uh, I remembered that, and because of remembering that, I bought a Virago uh, Yamaha Virago 750, which had just come out, and it was very um, unusual looking bike, and I knew that it would attract some. I would go to Cape Canaveral uh, or the beach. Uh, what What's the name of the beach that's near Cape Canaveral? Um, anyway, the beach there. And I would park the bike on the beach and somebody would come over and check out the bike and, and they would have a pass to get on base to see the launch. I knew that's what my future was. So that's why I bought the motorcycle. I took it, stuck it on the beach. The guy came over, looked at it, asked me how I was going to see the launch. I said, I didn't know. He said, well, I got a pass to get on base. You can ride with us. And, and he had me babysit his children while he, go, while he went out look, uh, uh, looking after other women. You know, his wife is home with the, the youngest kid, and she's not with them. And he, he went to the bars to check out other women and you know just to drink and have fun and you know be a human and uh and left me to babysit his kids <laughs> so i laid on the beach in a, a sleeping bag uh going in and out of sleep uh with his kids so that you know at least an adult was there with them and uh, i don't remember where the other where the boy the young man that was the passenger I don't remember uh, him being around us after we were on the beach. Uh, when I was laying with his kids, you know, in my sleeping bag on the beach, I don't remember that young man being around. I don't remember when he, when this, the father went out partying uh, at the clubs. All the night before the launch. Yeah, it was the night before yeah. the launch. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that was the night before the attempted launch. And uh, the first launch didn't go off. It, it, they stopped it at 10 seconds before the. Before oh, I didn't the, know that. Yeah, 10 seconds before the launch, it, it was stopped. And then it was scrubbed. An hour or two later, it was scrubbed. And then they um, rescheduled it for. This was like on a Saturday. I th it was a, maybe the Friday or Saturday. And then they, I think it was a Friday, and then they rescheduled it for the next Monday or Tuesday, uh, you know, three or four days later. And uh, so we went uh, down to Day. I followed those guys down to Daytona from Cape Canaveral, and uh, and we hung out, uh, spent a couple days there. I just slept. Because I'd, I'd stayed awake for two nights in a row, or three nights in a row, getting from Houston to Florida, or, or uh, Houston to Cape Canaveral. And and so I was dead tired. I slept like three days in a row the whole time. Anyway, uh, but when I flash forward to Peru, uh, when we were outside the back of this uh, uh huge thatched hut and this other guy spotted an alien craft above us way up in the sky um, and we all started looking at this thing through binoculars and stuff and uh, there was a lady who was the she was like a um, 
like a spiritual advisor, psychologist or something for this little kid, for this young man who was like 18, 19 ish, who was having some kind of issues. And she was sitting, you know, I was with him standing there looking at this thing. He couldn't look through it because he had glasses. He couldn't look through the binoculars. He could see it with his naked eye, though, but uh, but it was very small. But uh, anyway, the reason why I brought all this up was the his advisor, the lady, who she was sitting on her rear on the ground, leaning up against this huge hut. And we all told her, you know, the three three males, we were standing up looking at this thing. We told her about this alien craft. She didn't want to get up and look at it. She never got off her rear to get up and look at this thing. She didn't care. Wow. She had See? the same kind of mind state uh, the, as these two men, uh, grown men or young men and, and father in the station wagon on, on, on the base. Same, you know, I don't care. Nothing, you know, it's no big See, deal. That's not normal. I and know. Definitely. I know. There some, there's an alien. There's an influence. I don't know if it's an yeah. alien influence. There's something going oh, yeah. on definitely. for these well, they told me. They said we can control every person on the planet all at the same time. I mean, they're they're actually omnipotent. They are, you know, if you want to talk about God, these guys are gods, you know, with a small G, because they can they conceivably, from everything I've seen them do and, and from descriptions like yours, they can make people forget they're even on this planet, you know. I mean, they're just mind boggling. It's crazy. And there isn't any disease on this planet they can't cure. I've heard of them curing amazing diseases. I've heard of them taking people back from Alzheimer's. I mean, it, it's mind-boggling what they can do with us on a physical level as well as a consciousness level. It's mind-boggling. Well, the uh, what's the guy's name? What's the guy's name? The abductee who owns his own radio station. It was given to him by a friend, and uh, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -mm. Who does all the uh, alien interviews? I uh, don't. I don't know who it is. My problem is I work three, like three jobs, and I'm so busy I don't have time to listen to too much. So, well, uh, hold on one second. Um, oh, Joe Montaldo. Oh, Joe. Yeah, I know of Joe. So he thinks the, he believes that the greys are the policemen of the universe, or at least this galaxy, and they're more in charge than the reptilians, and the reptilians are subservient because of everything he's witnessed or heard about witnessing with, when those two creatures were together on the Earth. and But... The lady who interviewed me, uh, God, I, I have another one. The lady who interviewed me, uh, one second. Um, oh, I interviewed her too. Oh, geez. Uh, not Carrie. Uh, maybe, no, it was Carrie. It was uh, the lady. God, what is her name? The lady, oh, it's, She's witnessed the dragons. And, uh, Ooh, she's seen dragons? Uh, well, the, I told you about the dragons, right? Not much. I'd love to hear about them. Well, are you coming back on my show sometime soon and we can talk about them? Yeah, we can, sure. Um, I'm just talking about us. It's, it's our past. Anyway. Oh, the past about the dragons being the, 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 the guys that are basically the reptilians, right? Well, you don't know. Nobody's ever said that the reptilians that they talk about that are native to Earth that were supposed to be here long before we are here. Right. Nobody has said that they're descendants of the dragons, but we were the dragons, and uh, that was our one of our past civilizations on Earth before, probably long before Lemuria and Atlantis and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. some recently I heard somebody was saying that, you know, we all, they, we've had civilizations on Earth that were half bird and hu half human and half this and, ha you know, half all kinds of things. But that was in the uh, that Sasquatch book, 
You know, you know the guy that talks about the Sasquatches, the uh, uh, Kiwani. Yeah, that's yeah. in his that's in his book. The Sasquatches are telling him that there were times when we were half bird, half human, and half whatever, half human, like five or six different things on the earth at different times. And that's something fantastic. else. But uh, anyway. Well, that's uh, fantastic. Any other stories that you want to talk about? Uh, no, I think we're, we did pretty good. I got quite a few in and people get to, people get to know me through these stories, which is wonderful. I do have one cute one that's very short. Um, sure. I was about... Um, I'd say 10, maybe nine or eight. I don't know. I had my two younger sisters were pretty young. So, you know, I'm four years older than my other sister. So I'm going to guess nine or eight. Um, we were watching uh, a movie, the the Wolfman movie, you know, on a big black and white TV set back in the, you know, 60s. And I, I used to have visions all the time. I have a, a Lee Harvey Oswald vision. I've had many, many visions growing up. But in this vision, I'm watching the movie and the wolfman is going through the, the uh, graveyard near his house. Apparently, his whole family is buried in this one place. So he's running through this graveyard as the wolfman and he stops and he looks down on his like grandfather or father's grave. And it says Talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T. -T, and that's the name of the wolfman and his family, right? And I saw that on the headstone, and I knew in that moment I was going to marry a man named Talbot. So I turned to my sister, who's like four or five, whatever, and I said, I'm going to marry the wolf man. And she's like, ah, you know, she's a little kid. She doesn't know what's going on, right? She's laughing at me. And then many, many years later, I met a man by the name of Talbot. I married him. He's my first husband. And my sister at the wedding, I completely forgotten about this. And she comes up to me after we're married and she says, you're not going to believe this. She goes, I just remembered when we were watching the Wolfman movie when we were little kids and you told me you were going to marry the Wolfman. She goes, well, you just did. <laughs> and I started laughing. It was really cute. I mean, it was just like, you know, many of many of my premonitions, uh, they I'd say I was keeping track for a long time on an Excel spreadsheet about all my premonitions and I was hitting like 85 to 90% on my stuff. Um, I've seen, and, and some of it isn't premonitions. Some of it is just visions of things that are going to happen, you know, that aren't involved with me. Like I saw Polly class being killed. I don't know if that's a premonition or a horrible event, but I saw her being killed and then, then I saw 9-11 happen before it happened and, you know, just all these things, you know, it's crazy. But a lot of people who have psychic abilities have this, so it's, it's really not that big of a deal. But uh, but it was really cute that I, I knew I was going to marry the wolf man. <laughs> so. so I was trying to remember the lady who, the dragons, oh, the uh, lady who, not the dragons, oh, okay, it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, I appreciate your coming on my show. Oh, it was fun, Charles. Thank you. And you'll have to come on mine, too, again soon. Um, I am changing the format of my show. January 1st, I, I start a new adventure. We're going to be uh, podcasting with video and streaming live to many different places. And uh, it's going to be quite a bit different uh, as far as that goes. Um, the only problems I'm having right now are trying to figure out how to get it on Revolution Radio simulcasting with all my other things, but I'll get that figured out. Can't be that hard. Right? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if you can produce a UFO con, you can certainly get your... your uh... Oh, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, it's more of a technical thing. Like, do I need a mixing board? And, and how do I get Skype to work with Zoom? And, you know... <laughs> It's going to be, or yarn stream or, you know, whatever I'm doing. It's just going to be, it's the technical stuff that gets me. I, I'm pretty good at it, but every once in a while I can't quite figure it out. So we'll see what happens. It'll be fun. Well, monetizing, getting all that stuff together to where you're, um, you know, we used to think that broadcast was the big deal. And then 
like Joe Rogan got that huge deal with his podcast, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm, I doubt there's anybody on broadcast that has a deal with anything, anything close to that. Uh, I don't think that I'm going to be a, a next Joe Rogan, but you know, hey, I, I'm doing it for the love of it. And that's what's important to me and for people to get the information. And I think it's really important. This is what the ETs told me at one point, Charles. They said, no matter what I have on my show, no matter what we're doing, the most important thing is that we all tell our story. It isn't, you know, it. they didn't say go out and make money, write a book, make money off of it, do this, do that. It's just that we all need to tell our story so we can start comparing them and start figuring out how this all works as being a human being in connection and communication and relationship with ET. And that's what it's about. It's really, it's just a bunch of people sharing information and uh, there you go. And the more we got to, to, to work from, then the faster we'll, you know, maybe ascend to a next level where we're, you know, in telepathic communication with them all the time. Who knows? You well, know? I, I know what I, I was, last 10 or 15 minutes of my conversation, I was trying to get uh, a circle around this. Joe, Joe Montaldo believed, remember I was saying a while ago that the, that the, the reptile, Tillians were subservient to the Greys, who had the more powerful minds and all that. Mm -hmm. But then the lady, I was trying to remember her name. Uh, I interviewed her. She interviewed me. And and she was saying that when she was up on the ship, ships, that uh, there was no uh, alien that was in charge. You know, there was no, like, the, the Greys were more powerful than the reptilians or that it was all uh everybody was the same we're equals all in the right. class so you have joe who's the most probably the most knowledgeable ducty that i i've met so far saying one thing and you have somebody else who um i still can't come up with their name uh is saying something very different and you're like Okay, well, he's got all this knowledge, and he thinks this, and he, you know, he's got information beyond, you know, it's not just in his head. Uh, but yet, she's been on the craft, and she's saying, "Well, it's not that way up there." You're like, so, like, who's right? You know, that's my. Well, see, now that's that's why I said it's important we all get all this information, we put it together because one of the things we're going to find out eventually is that. Um, some of us are reading the, the signals correctly, okay? And some of us are interpreting them as we want them to be or what we think what that means. And what I mean by that is maybe Joe was on a ship and he saw that um, a reptilian was getting an instrument for a gray and his mind interpreted as the reptilian was subservient to the gray. No, you no, know, no. It, what? No, what what he was talking about, what he, the the story he always brings up, is that uh, in New Orleans uh, there was Greys and uh, reptilians together. I don't even know. You know, there's all these different stories he tells, but he what he says is that every time uh, the Greys are together with the reptilians, that the reptilians don't even look at the grays they they like keep you know eyes you know bow you know slightly bowed really? or yeah he's he's he talks about many different experiences it's not one first of all it's not on board because he doesn't i don't think he remembers a lot of the onboard stuff his stuff is all on earth stuff that he had that uh he's you know he he's uh encountered a lot of them here on the planet and um and but it's not onboard information um you're not going to believe this but my battery is dying on my computer i didn't realize it wasn't charging and i'm going to have to go or we're going to get cut off <laughs> not a problem let me stop the recording <laughs>